Hi, uh, my name is Tanawit. I am pleased to welcome you all on behalf of BTLJ. Our next panel is Legislative Approaches, and Chris Hovnagel will be moderating this conversation. It is my great pleasure to introduce Chris Hovnagel. Hovnagel graduated from University of Georgia School of Law, and he is a professor of law and a faculty director of Berkeley Center for Law and, and Technology. He is also a professor of practice in the School of Information and is an affiliated faculty member of the Simons Institute of for the Theory of Computing. In addition, he is the author of the Law and Policy for the Quantum Age with Simon uh, Garfin Kell, published by the Cambridge University Press in uh, 2021. And also the Federal Trade Commission Privacy Law and Policy, published by the Cambridge University Press 2016. Last but not least, he is of the Council to the Gunderson, Dad Dadmer, Stowe, Weller, Franklin, and Hashigen LLP, and an elected member of the American Law Institute. With that, I will pass the microphone to the Chris Hofnagel. Thank you. Thank you, Tanabit. I really appreciate that introduction. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning to talk about legislative approaches for repair rights and interests. I wanna begin by congratulating Professor Samuelson and Persinowski for such an excellent program. And for me, at least, it's an honor to be part of a program that is included, uh, that, or will include Senator Wyden, uh, but also Kyle Wiens and Tim Wu from last week. It's really been a treat. So today we're gonna to talk about the legislative landscape for repair interests. Um, and we're joined by four experts in order to get right into it, I'm gonna briefly introduce them. Um, we have Nathan Proctor, who is Senior Campaign Director for the Right to Repair Project from the US Public Interest Research Group. Professor Blake Reed is Clinical Professor of Law at the University of, Cal uh, excuse me, the University of Colorado Law School, a wonderful institution that's done so much in technology policy. Carrie Sheenan is former iFixit Policy Director she is now an independent policy consultant specializing in intellectual property, the right to repair, and hardware autonomy. Finally, we have Matthew Williams, who is a partner with Mitchell Silverberg Knopf with a concentration in copyright law. That's our group. I encourage everyone on the webinar to submit questions. Just put them in the chat. We'll get to those questions soon. But I thought I would start by throwing out a descriptive question. And it's, um, maybe we could start with Nathan. Um, what is the state of play in this field? So what are the primary characteristics of the legislative approaches that exist out there? Yes, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for your introduction. And, and hello, everybody. So many, so many wonderful people I know on this. Uh, it's good to see you all. Um, there, I would say the core of right to repair legislation is based on the model legislation, which you can find at repair.org slash legislation, which was developed by repair.org in partnership with Consumer Reports, which has given a lot of feedback on it. And actually now that the FTC, FTC is actually given a review of that model legislation as well. Um, and the goal of that is to, you know, basically create equitable access or, or, you know, kind of equal access to owners and independent shops to the materials that the authorized repairers of the manufacturers have access to, to facilitate repairs, the parts, the tools, and the documentation. So that is, the, I would say, and if you look at the main source of legislation out there, that, that's the biggest chunk of reforms would require manufacturers to provide access to the same kinds of parts, tools, and information that they use for their own authorized repair to independent and DIY repair. I can, I can I think... go through all the things that are happening in terms of legislation, but I'm guessing we'll, we'll start there. And, you know, because there's like, there, there are many other things that are happening. I'm sure there are many bills. And I think it makes sense to start up from a high level of what the characteristics of these approaches are. And I think Carrie wants to get in on this conversation as well. Sure. So I, I think taking a 
a higher level view, we're seeing a certain categorical approaches to right to repair emerge. Nathan mentioned the uh, model legislation, the, the model of the bill that's kind of sweeping the US, uh, which requires manufacturers to provide equal access to independent repair providers and owners that they provide to their authorized repair provider. And that kind of falls squarely in the competition framework, in my opinion. We also see folks taking on more consumer protection angles and in tackling right to repair kind of globally. So we have the French Repair Index, France passed a requirement that uh, companies selling certain types of electronic devices assess the repairability of those devices and provide a repairability score uh, on a label at the point of sale so consumers can compare more, compare between products in terms of repairability and overall long-term cost and durability, uh, and then make more informed choices. So kind of rectifying the information asymmetry issues involved uh, and protecting con consumers against potential deceptive marketing. I think we're also seeing um, some approaches coming out of copyright reform, uh, both in the US and abroad. Uh, so we have the, the representatives Jones and um, under Jones and Victoria Sparts have introduced the Freedom to Repair Act in the US, which would uh, create a kind of permanent exemption to Section 1201 for uh, repair of consumer electronic devices and the production and distribution of, of circumvention tools for purposes of repair. We're also seeing governments in Canada and Australia who have similar laws on the books, similar to our Section 1201 anti-circumvention laws, take on and consider uh, broader exemptions to those to those laws in order to enable repair and non-infringing repair. But I think there's also a kind of variety of ways we can approach this beyond just what we've kind of already done with copyright reform, uh, consumer protection and, and competition. And certainly there are also a lot of laws already on the books that, that are being used to reinforce right to repair, including the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, including some of the FTC's existing uh, d just consumer protection and competition authority. So I'll leave kind of that for more of our speculative questions. But uh, in terms of state of play, yeah, I think we can sort these into general approaches. And, and I think it's also good to note that there's a distinct difference in the framing of right to repair between US and, and the EU. And the EU has made a lot of progress. Uh, and they framed their debate and, and motivation for right to repair largely around environmental protection and the, and the circular economy uh, and kind of hitched their right to repair initiatives on uh, the EU's circular economy plans, where in the US, we've taken a very rights-based or individual ownership's rights-based approach. Uh, although the legislation itself doesn't necessarily reflect that, it reflects more this kind of uh, rectifying the, the anti-competitive situation in the aftermarket for repair. That's a great landscape. And let me invite anyone from the panel to reflect on this and uh, staying on this kind of descriptive aspect. Carrie, you nicely outlined, I think you nicely complemented Nathan's um, summary that we have interventions that are um, uh, in the competition space, in the consumer protection space, um, in uh, the environmental case, and copyright. But Kyle Ween said something um, that goes kind of beyond anything. You, uh, you've talked about so far. And th that was the idea that there are some products that just should be illegal based on their lack of repairability or the kind of uh, the dumpster fire problem I, I, uh, of, of the garbage trucks um, uh, uh, catching on fire. Um, are any legislators thinking about the terms at that level of scrutiny of, you know, there's a class of products or a class of ingredients that should be just off the table? That's a great question. Do you mind if I jump in? Um, Go for it. So I think the EPA actually has room to jump in in this space. So one issue that um, I know the EPA is considering and, and one issue that I know certain state governments have considered, including a, a state of Washington and past legislative sessions, is prohibiting glued in batteries. So one of the biggest problems with repairing your own devices is the inability to remove and replace the battery. And the death of the battery can mean the death of the entire product lifetime. So you can have a product that could last you know, seven to 10 years and the battery only lasts three, you're limiting the life cycle of that battery, that, that device, it's prematurely obsolescent. It just it, it contributes to the growing environmental waste problem. Uh, so what the EPA could do on, if under its uh, mercury, mercury containing battery act, I'm missing a couple words from that statutory title, <laughs> but they have the power to regulate batteries that, that contain potential toxics and uh, lithium ion batteries, well, less toxic than, than lead acid batteries, 
do have some toxic risks and do pose a risk to human health, including through the fires, the dump truck fires, the fires at landfills and processing facilities caused by compromised lithium ion batteries. And so the EPA would have authority under that act, I think very likely to require that batteries and consumer electronic devices be removable and replaceable. Uh, the EU is also considering this, uh, considering mandating product design around uh, around batteries such that batteries are removable and replaceable by the consumer. I think it's a it's a it could be potentially a heavy lift outside of the EPA context. I think legislators are somewhat reluctant to dictate design decisions in the US. Uh, EU is much more um, I would say progressive on that front, they're, they're much more willing to take that step. Uh, but I think it's, I, you know, it's not a terrible idea. <laughs> and we do have, as we'll talk about, if we, if we move into some of the shortcomings of some of these approaches, the, the model legislation we have in the US does leave a significant loophole um, for companies who do produce just a lot of electronic junk with no intent for it ever to be repaired. Chris, so thanks I for that. Any on other one? Yeah, please go ahead, Blake. I'm sorry, Chris, I don't mean to step on your toes. I just want to put a finer point on uh, on what Carrie had to say, which is, I think at least here in the US, when we're talking about the most aggressive sort of design mandate as being what Carrie described, uh, and it would be quite complicated to achieve, although I think the, the EPA could do it, is at the end of the day, uh, don't, don't put gluten batteries in, right? And I think there's a pretty big gap between that and, and just to pivot us, Chris, because I know we're going to go to the normative question next to the vision that Kyle laid out, which is we should be talking about repairable devices in a broader sense. We should be talking about modular design. We should be talking about repairable design. And I think I, I haven't seen, at least in the United States, I'm really interested to hear more about the European context, the kinds of design mandates that would get to that normative vision that Kyle is talking about. You've reached the normative um, um, barrier, and, and that's actually where I want to go next. I'll say that I was a little worried because when I first heard you and Carrie mention batteries, I thought you were saying gluten batteries, as in batteries containing gluten. And I was like, oh, you know, the market the, in California. Those are also not out. allowed here in Boulder, uh, just to, just to <laughs> yeah. be clear. So no gluten batteries for sure. Um, but uh, Blake, let's let's stick with you. Um, what is the normative vision? So, so we often talk about the mechanisms of uh, consumer rights, but like, what do we want the world to look like five and ten years from now? Well, I I think there's this this really interesting dynamic, and I should I should say I've, I've been involved in the um, in, in the consideration of the the Colorado right to repair bill that that Kyle referenced, and speaking only on uh, on my own behalf here, and not not anyone else uh, associated with that. One of the really interesting things about the campaign around that is the slogan "Right to Repair," right? is incredibly captivating to people. I don't think you can say that to anyone, whether it's a legislator or a policymaker or an academic or just a regular person for whom that is not an incredibly evocative idea, right? It's like repair, like no one, no one is opposed to that on, on some level. But I think when you start to tease apart, what does that mean? Um, you see folks in the movement, you see folks um, who are not in the movement, you see legislators for whom that conjures a very specific and different set of ideas. Um, and, and I think it's worth, worth laying it out. And, and we could talk about um, what, what right means in a Hofeldian sense. But I mean, just to, just to be more practical about it, um, I, I think it, it could be uh, a device uh, could, shouldn't break, right? Like a, a device should be repaired, right? Or it, it should never uh, 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 slip into a state of breakage. Or if it has broken, it should be fixed, right? The result is the thing that matters. Or it should be fixable in a particular way. So maybe, um, maybe it should be fixable in in the context of an independent repair ecosystem, or it should be fixable in a very broad libertarian sense, the sort of, I want to tinker with my device sense. So I think across those four different visions, and, and I'm not sure where the sort of the device itself needs to be repairable, where the mandate, I'm not sure quite where that fix, fits into that taxonomy, but there's really different legislative approaches to getting to each of those 
to outcomes and some of them overlap and I think some of them might not. Um, and, and I think the, the curious thing to me is when we look at what is currently in US law, we have a little bit of the libertarian piece, right? We have the copyright exemptions and limitations. We've got that sort of fleshed out. We've got some kind of incremental incursion on the fringes on the environmental stuff. And then we've got this right to repair bill, which is 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 pretty modest. The model legislation, I think, is, is pretty modest in terms of some of these outcomes, right? It says manufacturers have got to make available parts and manuals and tools and so forth. And so I think there is still that like notion of like at the core of uh, what what's at the core of all of that is, is there something bigger to the notion of repair or the right to repair and i think it really depends on who you ask and i think as we get further into this movement further into developing legislation we're going to have to start answering those questions about do we want design mandates do we want hardcore libertarian fix your stuff do whatever you want with your stuff tinker with your stuff stuff do we we want hardcore environmental protections. Like, I think those questions are still kind of unanswered at, at this stage of the movement. Let's turn to Matthew Williams and ask him about what the vision might look like for the copyright part of this debate. We've talked a lot about the kind of the hardware and the kind of the manuals and so on. Uh, Matthew, um, help us understand what a, a, the right landscape, a landscape we'd like to have exist, let's say five to 10 years from now here. Yes, thank you for, for having me. And um, uh, it's been an interesting discussion. Uh, Kyle is a really impassioned advocate and, and I've always enjoyed listening to him and, and, and Blake and Carrie as well. Um, I think I'm here because in the section 1201 DMCA rulemaking, I represent some of the larger trade associations of copyright owners, including the video game uh, ESA uh, Trade Association, and um, I'm happy to to speak to that. Five to ten years from now, that's that's tough. Uh, I, I'm not an in-house lawyer, and uh, even if I was, I don't know if I could speak to five to ten years uh, from now. But uh, I'll try to try to address your question. I think the way I see it is um, this right to repair. I think someone referred to it as a slogan. Um, uh, it's it's certainly a powerful uh, political galvanizer. Um, it, it's it's a rhetorical device that works well, um, and and all of that work has flowed into my clients' understanding even better than they did before the need to try to address these concerns and build out products and services that don't cause problems for their customers. That's their number one objective, of course. They're in a business. They're not trying to create products and services that, that people don't enjoy. Uh, so that's number one. And, and we've tried in my regulatory work to deal with that. Uh, we, we, we don't try to disparage anyone who's looking uh, to repair devices, et cetera. On the other hand, there's got to be, in our point of view, at least in mine, personally, a, a balance um, where, yes, uh, you can come up with ways to argue that uh, repairs are, are difficult or uh, uh, harder in certain contexts. Historically, you know, cars, other appliances, I think, are a little different. But if you really look at the entertainment space, the, um, the available options for content, for services, for devices are so much broader now, 25 years after the DMCA was passed than they were in 1996, 1998, when that law was being debated and adopted and effective, that I think that's gotta be taken into account when you think about these issues, because it's it's not just um, you know, is there some abstract right that exists um, that's inalienable? It doesn't sound like anyone's saying that, right? It's more about what could we do before 
that we can't do now. And that's, I think, what the right to repair, in quotes, encompasses. It's this expectation consumers have that, hey, I feel like I should be able to do this, and now you're telling me I can't. My client's goal is to make that scenario non-existent, ideally. But when they have to take into account copyright infringement, et cetera, the, the product design and the way that they use uh, technological protection measures has to be adjusted. And so it's really a balance. And I think for policymakers, since we're talking about legislation, they have to balance that as well. And, and I don't think anyone I represent, and certainly not me personally, is coming at this from a negative, you know, disparaging point of view. This is a, a bad movement. It shouldn't exist, or there should be no goal to enable consumers or people that work with consumers to uh, advance these interests. On the other hand, infringement is real. Consumers are benefiting significantly from increased content, increased devices that access content. And so all of that has to be taken together as a piece. Uh, and, and so that, that would be my comment on it. Maybe we could go just a degree deeper on that very issue of what are the core interests that are important to preserve from the copyright holder uh, perspective. And, and, and so it sounds like there's an intersection here that has nothing to do with repair. It's just, if, if the device, if more information is publicly available about the device, the device can do more infringement. So you maybe you get a, a, a protected, a copyright protected stream of content. Maybe you're able to look at a, a DVD that you're not supposed to look to and so on. So I, I hear that interest could you help us flesh out and, and kind of understand the, the, the scope of interests there? I hope so. Um, so yes, I think one, what you identified just now is one kind of layer. And um, I feel strongly about that layer in that on certain devices, it causes big problems, but other people will say, well, on a general purpose computing device, you can already stream infringing content, so why should it matter if you can do it on a video game console? Or why should it matter if you can do it on some other device that uses TPMs to try to prevent that? So the, the core example that we've dealt with in the Section 1201 rulemaking is actual video game consoles and their ability to use uh, technological protection measures, access controls to uh, authenticate games, to prevent infringement of games uh, on those devices. And the Copyright Office has repeatedly said that this is a unique ecosystem. It's different than a refrigerator. It's different than a printer. Uh, I'm not representing those industries and I can't speak to their arguments, but it, video games are different on a console. Uh, and so the exemption that we have now that relates to consoles is only for replacement of an optical disk drive for section 1201. And that's because the office has looked at it over and over. And that's the only thing that they've identified where they felt like there wasn't a real infringement risk um, by allowing these kinds of uh, alterations of a console. So, you could probably come up with similar arguments about a, a Blu-ray player, um, but entertainment wise, there's relatively few devices in that category. Um, and so, like I said, if you get into some of these other industries, I can't really speak to their needs, but if you're dealing with legislative solutions and you're talking either at the state or the federal level, but especially at the federal level, because I think at the state level, a lot of these bills are probably conflict preempted. They're probably not enforceable. Um, if you exclude a lot of these entertainment devices or the small number of entertainment devices, really, from your point of view, if, if you're an advocate of repair legislation, you may be better off, in, I think. But. Hey, let's turn back to our panel. I know Carrie wants to get in on this, and I know Nathan does as well. Um, let me uh, let me reflect back 
uh, some of Blake's points, and that's the kind of, you know, the framing of rights means that the right of repair has the logic of rights. And I'll tell you what we're learning in the kind of, in the privacy field is that you can load up people with rights, but that doesn't actually mean much if they don't know about the rights and if they don't have the time and the kind of will to deal with the, the churn of writing letters to companies and so on. So the logic of rights is now becoming um, uh, more scrutinized in the privacy field and people are talking about responsibilities. Um, maybe, I know Carrie, you wanted to get back in on the normative goals more broadly, but I also want to invite Nathan and Carrie to talk about the rights framework versus other frameworks. Yeah, and I can actually say um, one of the nice things about this, the state legislative approach that, that we've taken in the US on right to repair and in some of the design um, mandates that the EU is taking up is that those are really enablement laws. Like they're not, they're not framed as a, a right to repair in the context of traditional ownership rights, which I think is very important and we can talk about kind of later, but they are, are framed in making sure that people have the access that they need and that they have access to independent repair shops um, and that these independent repair shops, you know, by leveling the playing field between independent repair shops and authorized repair shops and the companies own repair programs, uh, make sure that consumers have more access to repair services. So if you own a device and you don't have the time to learn or interest or you know, motivation to learn to fix your own device, um, these by, by restoring what can call competition to the aftermarket right to repair space, um, they would make sure that repair businesses can survive and thrive to agree that, that they're not able to at the moment uh, and would increase consumer access to repair by increasing their access to repair professionals. So I think that, I think that that's uh, a, a really nice thing that, the, that these laws do is that they move beyond just the strict laws framework and think about how do we enable people to uh, access repair? How do we enable uh, a broader cultural change in how we think about uh, our devices and our, the lifetimes of our devices and, and the repairability of our devices? Nathan? Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, what you exactly you wanted me to weigh in on. Um, well, I have a, a, a kind of different thread here to ask about, and, and that is, is anyone thinking about insurance as a remedy? So I, I think, um, um, you know, when people buy their iPhones and other devices, there often is some type of insurance offered, uh, but you could imagine an insurance that was um, uh, broadly applicable to, to the type of repair organizations um, that Carrie just um, uh, mentioned. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that there, especially, you know, kind of at the federal level, there are insurance companies, insurance providers who have started weighing in on right to repair on the positive side because they have to pay uh, the rates that the manufacturers set for their authorized repair services for any kind of covered device. And those are often uh, th those prices are rising uh, too quickly. Um, this is especially true in the auto space where auto like State Farm and these companies are now engaging in legislation because they want to control the costs of the of the of repairs, which are going up, you know, too quickly in, in an overly constricted market. I think healthcare is another place where insurance companies could probably start weighing in. It's unbelievable uh, price gouging that happens around servicing of medical equipment, the, the amount of, uh, you know, kind of overcharging that manufacturers do for their service contracts, which are really hard to get around purchasing because it's, it's so restricted on who can work on the machines by design. Um, but I haven't, I haven't, your specific idea, I have, haven't come across, but I do know that insurance companies are starting to weigh in on this, uh, especially in the, from the car perspective, but I think we could see more. It, it is, um, I think and so, on some of, in some of the cases of these products, it's just stupid extra money that we're dumping in to pay for somebody else to do the repair with no quality difference, with no technical certification difference. It's just you pay four times as much to get somebody with one patch on their shirt to fix it. That same employee takes off the patch, puts on another company patch the other three days of the week, which happens in hospitals all the time. Somebody's working for GE on Monday and Tuesday, 
Wednesday through Friday, they work for the hospital. They're allowed to fix the MRI on Monday and Tuesday. If it goes out on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, tough luck, reschedule the surgery. So that narrative starts us into our next question about the gaps that possibly need to be filled here. You mentioned medical. I know Blake wants to get in on this issue, uh, wants to reflect back on what you were just discussing, but also I want to broaden the discussion to the areas that um, we haven't focused on, the kind of the gaps like the, um, the wheelchair repair, which was so compelling, um, but is just one small piece of this puzzle. Blake? Yeah, Chris, I'll try and respond to this question and, and tie back some of the, the themes from, from the last round of responses. And I, I actually want to go back to video games just really quickly, because I, I, I was thinking as Matt was talking about um, way back when I, I had an Xbox 360 and I got the infamous red ring of death, right? It stopped, it stopped working and think about how I felt in that, in that moment. And I think the the impulse I had there was like, I just want to get this fixed, right? Like now I can't play uh, Splinter Cell or Forza or whatever I was, it was, it was playing back then. Um, and I think when we look at these issues through the sort of intellectual property lens, we kind of reduce this to, to this notion that on one side, there are serious intellectual property concerns, there's piracy at issue, there's all that stuff. And then on the other side, there's someone who wants to like, get out the screwdrivers, get out the soldering iron, like go down to the maker space and like start fiddling with the thing. And I think about me and, and I think, I think about people like my mom who, you know, deals with a lot of medical equipment. I think about my family dealing with similar kind of scenarios. And what we actually feel in that moment is this, this feeling of like powerlessness and helplessness, right? It's like, we have this expensive thing that we have for a reason and it doesn't work, right? And how do we escape from this? And I think sitting above that is what, what Nathan was getting after in response to your insurance question, Chris, which is there is this whole system of inefficiency that people have to navigate, have to incur all this life admin costs. And then we get to these big institutional costs when I have to figure out how do I repair my video game console? How do I get this red ring of death fixed? Or how do I get my you know, medical equipment fixed? How do I get my wheelchair fixed? And I think if you, you know, listening in on the Colorado right to repair, listening into the hearing and hearing people talk about the experiences, it's miserable, right? It's like, we are going to deal with this bureaucracy that is going to end up costing us a lot of time, a lot of money, and probably isn't going to end up with our thing being restored to the way it was. And like, it's just lose, lose for everyone involved. And so to the question about legislative gaps, what I think we're not quite there yet with, but I think the model legislation starts to get us towards is what is the glue that we need? What are the systemic fixes that we need so that when someone gets into that scenario, right, where their thing is broken and they need to get it fixed. Well, I mean, first of all, to Matt's point, how do we avoid that scenario? But when it happens, what are all of the pieces that we need in place for someone to get their product fixed as quickly, as effectively, as reliably, and as inexpensively as possible? And I think it takes a whole bunch of approaches that are not on the table, right? Some of it is design mandates, right? Some of it is addressing how these products are manufactured. Some of it is dealing with the sort of libertarian issues like intellectual property so that we can have a competitive competitive landscape of independent repair shops. Some of it is con traditional consumer protection law, Chris, I think to, to your background, it is having the FTC and state attorneys general look at the practices of what companies are doing around their products and the surrounding repair ecosystems. It's the environmental regulations coming in on the side and saying, these kinds of practices are, uh, are out of bounds. But I think we don't get to that that sort of like holistic right to repair unless we deal with all of these, right? We have to make progress on all of these fronts to actually end up in a world where the average person dealing with the broken thing can say, 
no problem, right? Like I've got a solution in front of me, whatever that solution um, looks like. So that's when I think about the gaps, that's, that's what I think about is all of those missing pieces in, in that chain that add up to repair, a state of repair being possible. Let me pose a question about the metaverse and to get you all thinking about this. Um, there's a great question in the chat from Stephen Chow that um, discusses an American Law Institute um, um, proceeding uh, concerning a new type of transaction, um, one that is bundled, including a software and service and so on. <clears throat> the amendments to the Article 2 of UCC would create a hybrid transaction. And of course, if I were in this field, that's what I'd be doing. I'd as soon as consumer protection shows up, what you do is you create a new service and give it a new name so that it's out <laughs> of anything. Um, and so these hybrid transactions would have different characteristics depending on their predominant purpose. Well, when I listen to that description, I think about the metaverse. And when I look at the metaverse, it's, it's not, I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious that it's a, it, um, one main purpose of the metaverse is to, take back control over all sorts of um, um, intellectual property that essentially was loosened with the creation of the web. So the, you know, why is Disney and so on and so interested in the metaverse? Well, they wanna be able to give you a, a, um, an NFT shirt that is certifiably from Disney and not from like the Walmart where you might've gotten a knockoff Disney shirt. Um, so, it seems like the metaverse might be an area where we might start thinking about devices, software, and services, where the kind of logic of lockdown could become very um, intense. And maybe, Carrie, maybe, you, maybe I'm making some sense to you. I'm not sure I'm making sense to everyone. Yeah, I think, um, and I'm not sure how metaverse specific uh, what I'm going to say is, but I think, yeah, we've been seeing trends for the last decade of companies increasingly moving towards software as a service um, and increasingly tinkering with the idea that you own the personal product and you and you own the copy of the software inside the personal product that you bought uh, and also tinkering with the definition of what it means to own something or to buy something versus rent it. And so we've seen a kind of with the proliferation of software into everything and with, with the growth of end user license agreement to, to govern those, govern that software, um, we have seen a kind of continuing erosion of your kind of right, your ownership rights in digital goods, including the digital goods that are embedded in hardware uh, and including your data that's uploaded to a cloud or your creative productions that become part of these software as a service cloud uh, systems. And you have devices that become cloud reliant. So I think one significant gap that I see and that's kind of more big picture and more thinking about, you know, five to 10 years down the road, uh, and also somewhat normatively, I think we, I think we lose something by focusing strict on a strict definition of right to repair. And that is, um, there is a whole, there are a whole bunch of normatively valuable activities that are lost through the process of, of eroding this definition of ownership, eroding your ability to, to own your own devices. Uh, and it goes beyond just a strict version of restoring something to its original functionality and into what Pam Samuelson calls the freedom to tinker uh, and all of the, the helpful innovations and both cultural and, and uh, technological inventions that come from user innovation and user tinkering along with the right to repair. Um, and so I think in terms of filling that gap, I think we do need to start thinking more broadly about how we correct some of these, these issues, how we um, address this erosion of ownership, how we address the overreach in end user license agreements, how we address deceptive buy versus lease claims. Uh, and that'll help head off things like, App like Apple's uh, proposed or rumored proposed initiative to move all hardware to subscription-based. Uh, so to move their, their phones and certain Macs to subscription-based hardware position rather than ownership of a specific device. So we've got a hot panel now. Let's uh, let's hear from Matthew, and then we'll go to Nathan and Blake. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It is a, a evocative and interesting question that you posed. I, in my experience, just as an outside lawyer for for companies and trade associations, uh, it's very healthy that we have a lot of people especially very smart people, such as everyone who's participating in this symposium, that are concerned about 
what ifs, you know, uh, is this gonna be taken in a direction that's gonna really be bad for everybody in a significant way? Um, and that's very healthy and it, it, it's good for the marketplace, it's good for the companies, it's good for the country, it's good for, for, for everybody. Um, but what I've seen is not really companies or trade associations that are out there looking for schemes or, or mechanisms by which that they can uh, change the, the state of affairs in a negative way for their customers or for consumers or for voters. Or, uh, so these are, are very worthy considerations from my point of view uh, long-term and they, making sure that we keep raising them is essential but there's you know to me the idea that well you know maybe the metaverse will lock people in better and that's why companies are looking into it it's it's that's a uh uh it's it's the reverse like companies are looking into to ideas like that because they want to provide people what the people want and what they want to enjoy and they're looking to do it in the best way possible. And the restrictions come on the back end where the companies are trying to figure out how do we make this work in an effective way without uh, service degradation, without cheating, without IP violations. And then you, you get to the, what are the repercussions of that? So maybe there are some uh, detrimental impacts on consumers to those reactions by companies and maybe those need to be adjusted or fixed and maybe sometimes through law or regulation but oftentimes that can be fixed through the market so that's been my experience yeah, and, and, and please be clear i'm not trying to put a negative gloss on it. it i mean if you want to have like a, a luxury products market you have to have an ability to create um, rivalry amongst products and exclusivity um, so i think indeed there is a kind of consumer um, uh, a desire to have something like a way to prove that I have the official Disney avatar. Um, yeah. uh, and and, and I, it, it, the interesting thing to think about is, is what are the, the kind of the meta effects and the knock on? Yeah. That. Just quickly, I would say to me, it's actually, uh, if you want a luxury market, stop people from using access controls and TPMs under protection of law. That's provided a market that actually generates products at a much lower price point than if you did away with section 1201. Uh, but that's just me. Could, could you, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow that. Um, could you go sure. a bit deeper on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, and if anyone wants to look at this, it, we talk about it a lot in the 1201 rulemaking. Um, so the entertainment industries when in the late 90s going into 1201 being effective and into the world we're in now, um, they were worried that they, they couldn't offer product at a low price point without it being circulated broadly to multiple people. And so they wanted uh, in part the protections of the DMCA in order to make a lot of business models profitable that might otherwise be very risky. So if you look at subscription streaming, if you look at subscription download or download to rent or video on demand through cable or uh, lots of these models that actually create a lower price point than it would be if you bought the you know, Blu-ray disc, um, all of them are enabled by section 1201 and by TPMs. And so that's, that was the point I was trying to make is that if you really want to end up with a real luxury market where things are really expensive, let there be a lot of infringement and no legal protections for the entertainment industry. And then they'll be forced into decisions where they're offering things at lower, or I mean, at higher prices because they're trying to recoup their investment from a smaller number of transactions. Okay, interesting point. So we have a number of people who want to get in. I think Nathan and then Blake. Yeah, um, there's so much to say, but I want to start here. I, I think that there's a question which has nothing to do with the law, which is kind of a little bit more of like the social construct around 
what people want and will tolerate and what we, we should expect as the public in terms of, you know, I mean, many interlap overlapping issues, of course, our main concern, you know, is around repair. But I, I think that, you know, so when we talk about the right to repair as a concept and what it means, like, I think that there's a, there's a, a, a large piece of this, which is, um, and Leslie, we can hear you. Uh, uh, there's a large piece of this, which is like, people just got, got out of the habit of like expecting to repair certain things. And so it was, it was designed out of the process. Um, I, I, I'm willing to, to grant Matthew to some degree that many of these companies are just trying to compete in the marketplace rules that they view as fair and, and they're, uh, you know, not trying to find tricks or anything, but I will say that I've also encountered many tricks that are impossible to view with charity, and I don't know if they represent companies that Matthew would work with, but like it does happen that companies will do things to their customers, which I find unethical and immoral and sometimes ends up being illegal, um, you know, in order to improve profit, that they have this paradigm they have to operate in, which is we need more profit every quarter. And especially when you're a dominant manufacturer like John Deere, you have the same number of customers, they really can't go up. So you just have to try to take more and more from them if you want to keep making more money every quarter. And I think that we, we have some problems in that system. And then when you, so when you break into a new model, like if we had a new market, a metaverse or something like that, that might have opportunities to empower the consumer. But I'm pretty skeptical of that unless we really reboot the power of accountability for these companies. When we first launched the internet, we were in a much better situation, a policy perspective, just protecting the public interest in that market. And now we've eroded a lot of the protections. There's been significant regulatory capture by these big companies and so now I worry that the thing they would come up with would be kind of dystopian for the public, but unbelievably favorable to rights holders. And, and those are things that we need to balance, right? Like, I think all of us would say, yeah, it's good if people who make good products can afford to make those good products because their rights are protected. But we've clearly gone out of balance with the way that we're doing things in this country. And I think most people looking at technology would be those guys have too much power. And the real question is, how do we resolve these things? And how do we convince people to trust in the system again, the system is listening to their voice. And I think rights repair is a great example of the, the public pushing back and, and these companies being forced to defend their behavior. And in some cases, realizing that they need to change. And I think that's really healthy for a better relationship between the public and technology. Before we turn to Blake, let me just kind of pose this to Blake and, and Carrie. Um, Nathan, what you just discussed rhymes with one of the concerns brought up by a uh, panelist from last week, Professor Carl Shapiro, who said that one of his main concerns was the problem of kind of aftermarket opportunism. So how do you, I think what you've just described are the different opportunities for opportunism. And those opportunities seem to be greater in the aftermarket. You know, after you've made your purchase, it's all your, 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 your post information, essentially, you're locked in and so on. Uh, so maybe we could heighten our scrutiny on this kind of um, post transaction series of uh, uh, guiles that we, of guile that we want to limit. And let's turn to Blake and then Gary. Yeah, Chris, I, I, let me let me try and tie in what, what Nathan had to say with with that that question, which I think is a really good provocation around what kind of transactions are we engaging in? And I guess the way I think about it, I think of it as a spectrum. And I think on one end of the spectrum are the kind of transactions that um, that Aaron Perzanowski and, and Jason Schultz described in, in their book, The End of Ownership, which is, I, I feel like we're just plugging Aaron's library today. Everyone should, should check out uh, uh, the, the, end of, the End of Ownership. Um, you can get a digital copy or you can go get a physical copy, maybe at your, at your local library. 
Um, depends on your philosophy on this. But I think the kind of transaction they envision, and there's a, there's a little bit of nostalgia to it, is the idea that we purchase something, that, that transaction then gives us this dominion over this artifact, right? That that's not the right one, Nathan. It's the it's the it's the other one. That one that one's good too. Um, but we got dominion over this artifact, and then we are concerned as a matter of these these post transaction uh, as, as sort of aftermarket opportunities um, about the liberty of the artifact owner, right, and what they can do, and all of that sort of thing. And and I think. Um, I, I think I heard Carrie and I, I, I think Aaron for sure and, and Jason in the book bemoan the transition away from that to the model, Chris, that you described, which I, I have to express some skepticism that the metaverse is the thing. I, I might draw draw like the uh, I might draw the endpoint on the other end of the scale a little bit sooner, and I like the way Carrie framed it as software as a service or the conversion of products to being services, right? Where the transaction is no longer um, uh, the the purchase of this artifact, which I own, but it is now this service relationship in which I'm engaging with in this with this entity or series of entities and so forth. And, and what does that entail? So I think in reality, transactions, the, the transactions that exist in today's marketplace for consumer electronics and the like fall across that spectrum, right? I, I think we can find examples that sit sort of everywhere. Um, and I think we can find normative arguments, whether this is to Matt's point, like the market functioning is intended or um, to Nathan's points that, and, and I think to the points that, that Aaron and Jason raised that we're really losing something by, by putting, um, by, by putting things down towards the service end of the spectrum. But I guess what I would say is we have not thought hard enough or not focused enough on if we are going to be stuck, Chris, with the provocation that you gave us, which is we're moving in the services direction, right? We're going to have all this lock-in. We're going to have all this vertical integration. We're going to have all that stuff. I don't think we have focused very much on, well, is that working as advertised, right? Is, is that is that actually delivering, right? I actually think like, man, that would be kind of interesting if Apple sold iPhones as a service, right? I like, I, you know, cycle through my iPhone and trade it in. I trust that Apple will recycle it and, and deal with it in the ways that, that, that Apple can do it. They operate at great scale. But if I go down that road, is Apple going to repair my device really quickly? Is it going to be really reliable? Am I going to be paying a fair price to that, for that? How do we, you you know, construct the rules of transactions around that. And I think that's kind of what Carl was, was getting after. And I think we are starting finally with the right to repair movement to move from analyzing the what can we do with this artifact to what are the contours of how you can provide the service. And if you're going to provide a really hardcore, you know, service way down on this end of the, the spectrum, there are going to be rules that you have to account for. We're going to require you to account to your consumers, both in price and in the, the contours of the service that you actually offer. We're going to hold you to account for your environmental practices. We're going to do all of this kind of stuff on the back end. And I think what Nathan was getting after is there's kind of an arbitrage that's happened in, in that lack of attention to that other end of the spectrum, which is we can shift things down to the service end of things, but we can keep the prices high. We can not focus on repair. We can not focus on environmental harms. We can sort of reap the profits that we used to reap in this old world, and uh, but shift shift accountability away. And and I think that's a real problem um, that we need to to address. And I hope this movement is poised to do it. So um, we only have five minutes left. So let me throw out one last question. I hope all of our panelists will have something to say about this, at least uh, briefly. Um, one big problem in the right to repair are, uh, does come to antisocial repairs. And so some of them have been floated, but I mean, if you live in California, a lot of people have modified their cars to uh, escape the emissions controls. Um, you have the rolling coal people uh, you have people who do things that uh, undermine the safety. I mean, it seems to me that these are all real concerns. Now, Kyle says, well, you still have to comply with the law, um, yet um, you don't have to look, you don't have to like look around society uh, too hard to see plenty of people are not complying with the law. Um, how should 
we think about the trade-offs of safety and kind of noxious forms of modification. And I'm wondering, is there a way to use cost-benefit analysis? Are there other traditional tools to think through when uh, safety concerns are just like too much to allow repair? Uh, Carrie, I think you want to get on on this one. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think we can talk about what we what we know to be true already, which is that scoff laws are going to be scoff laws regardless of the legal requirements that we place upon them. So the people who are voiding emissions controls right now, clearly there's not uh, if that's not enabled by a right to repair law. That's just that's something that they're doing despite laws that govern or or make illegal the modification of emissions uh, standard or the emission systems on their on their cars. Uh, similarly. You know, Section 1201 and, and the use of technological protection measures uh, stop mostly well-meaning people who just want to tinker with or fix their device or modify it to suit their needs. And if people are going to modify something to uh, contribute to intellectual property infringement, they're going to do that already. The reward for them to do that, you know, financial reward for large-scale piracy and infringement is high. Uh, and they can, most people who do that already are, are kind of hiding and, and distributing their goods illegally. And so, you know, opening up uh, a right to repair wouldn't then authorize those those harmful modifications legally, those would still be illegal. Uh, and I, I don't think it would make a whole new breed of people who want to be malicious modifiers, right? Because those folks would be doing that already. They're not waiting for us to pass a right to repair law uh, in order to start you know, making harmful modifications. Uh, I also, I, I kind of wanted to get back to something we were, we were just talking about too. I know we're moved on to another question. Um, but I think, you know, there's a temptation when we're talking about copyright to see it just as it exists for the authors, it exists to protect the financial interests of the authors or the companies that are distributing the software, or the video game console manufacturers, or the video game makers. But that's not how copyright works, right? Copyright is intended to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And the progress of science and the useful arts is advanced also through the recognition of users' rights and through the recognition of uh, the value of tinkering and innovation in the cultural and in the cultural and, and scientific spaces. And so I think one what thing to do moving forward and, and as we think about the, the challenges that, that Blake spoke about in terms of software as a service and hardware as a subscription uh, is thinking about how do we account for users' rights in how do we kind of formally enshrine uh, users' rights in these in these kind of agreements that we have? How do we constrain the operation of these agreements and transactions in order to give space for users' rights? Anyway, sorry. But, just... but inherent in that, inherent in placing in rights, we're basically saying that we don't have to think about costs. I mean, that's the idea behind rights is costs don't matter because I have a right, but there are costs here. Um, I think we're already seeing that, right? The, the copyright industries think only about their rights and not the cost to users' rights or folks who want to repair their devices or folks who need to adjust their accessibility devices to better suit the, their needs, right? So we're already in a framework where we have people thinking about purely the profits and the cost to authors, but not to the greater humanity. I think uh, Matthew is going to have the last word because we have one minute left. Uh, well, didn't realize it'd be the last word, but yeah, I just wanted to say I, I certainly did not intend to say that we should uh, protect copyright owners' rights at all, at all costs in any way. Uh, what I was trying to say is that um, I think the, the legal framework we've put in place through the DMCA to try to uh, encourage copyright owners and their technology partners to proliferate more products and services benefits everybody. And if there are ways, if there are times when it does not work, we need to think of policy ways, legislative ways, et cetera, to address those issues. And then I would just say also on the scoff laws point, that's an argument against every law, right? Uh, people are always gonna break the law, so why do you need the law? It doesn't really, uh, prove anything. And I've been hearing it for 25 years and, and uh, I just don't quite understand what it accomplishes because uh, yeah, sure, people are gonna break the law, but uh, without the law, we have no framework within to operate, so. Thank you. And thank you to all our panelists, Nathan Proctor, Blake Reed, Carrie Sheehan, and Matthew Williams. Thanks for spending time with BCLT today. 
I want to sign off here and hand it back to our BCLT team. And I think we have a 10 minute break. Thanks everyone.